how do you deal with the, the, the guilt or potential shame of asking for support as a leader? Because sometimes that's really difficult if you're the, the high performer or you have that positional authority and, and you, you know, you're struggling, how, how do you ask for help? So I look at the, that I look at asking for help as a gift for someone else. So one of my friends, Allie Stroker, she is in a wheelchair. She's a Broadway actress. One of the first Broadway actresses that's been like world renowned. She's incredible. And I remember she gave me the gift of this nugget. And she said, I don't need help with my wheelchair, but sometimes knowing that I can give someone the opportunity to feel helpful is a gift to them even if it's taking something away from me for just a moment. And I thought about that a lot because because she's so independent. Wow. She's fiercely just so vibrant and independent. And I thought about that. And she said, sometimes I just humble myself to let people help because they feel good about being the helper. And we've all heard that quote, like Mr. Rogers, where it's like, whenever there's a crisis, like look around, there will always be helpers. Sometimes people need that significance. They need that... Um, that ability to feel helpful. And so when I look at asking for help, I don't look at it as a weakness. I look at it as an opportunity to give someone else strength. And so it can really transform the way you feel about it. And asking for help is like flexing a muscle, right? Like the more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. Um, And so I just always think about what Allie said. And she's like, sometimes it's not about me. It's just to give them the gift of being a helper. And I think that when you grow a team, that can really honor other people's gifts. It's not a bad thing to ask for help. I love that. I love that. I would also say it's a hundred percent your job as a leader. And yeah. what I mean by that is if the leader's job is to help set and protect and, and curate the culture, yeah. you have to ask yourself, okay, let me get over my ego here. And would the team see me asking for help? Yes. Set a precedent that is behavior that we do on yeah. the and I think that's really important for everyone to see is like the, the number one thing I was I taught through the pandemic uh, to all our high performers was we must adopt the role model mindset during this time. Absolutely. There's, we want to do for our creature comforts or our safety or because our political affiliations or this, but it's like, okay, what's the precedent I want to set here? What, how, how would I like my family, my team, other people see me behave in this difficult situation or this difficult time because they'll remember it. Yeah. So, They'll remember how I responded. They'll remember how vulnerable or transparent I was. They'll remember the, the tone that I set. Yeah. I think it's so important. The reason you ask for help is you are setting the tone of permission. Yep. People can be vulnerable. Otherwise, if you're a leader and you never ask for help, what happens is you struggle for three months. Now, guess what? There's three or four other people on your team struggling for three or four months. The whole company becomes lethargic because people don't feel the permission, the courage to ask for help. Yes. I think that's so vital. And I yeah. love the frame of, hey, you're not just doing this. You're not just asking for help to get your, 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 your necessarily your needs served, but also it's helping other people in some way, whether giving them permission or actually making them feel helpful. I, I think that's incredible. So uh, first question. Yes. And this is great for you. I could never answer this, which is, <laughs> which is you know, uh, basically it's like my husband and I do not agree on child rearing. We don't mm-hmm. agree on how to be good parents. What would you recommend? Yeah, it's so interesting. So we have a two and a half year old and then I am almost 20 weeks pregnant. So halfway done, which is so exciting. Um, and so we have a lot of parenting discussion and it, and it is a very interesting role reversal with Drew being the stay at home parent um, and and myself being, being the worker. Um, we actually like take courses on parenting, which is so, you know, it's just, it's in alignment with growth day. You're never done growing. You don't know what you don't know. And so when we find areas that we were really struggling in, like at the beginning, it was sleep training. And it was like, we're going to sit down and devote a few hours just to understanding this. And then, you know, right now it's like the toddler tantrums. How do we want to handle those? Do we let the meltdowns happen? Do we hug? Do we walk away? Do we do timeouts? Like we don't know. And so 
it's super interesting because one, I think that the 21 questions approach can get you a long way in terms of understanding how someone else was brought up, because I think we bring a lot of our own childhood traumas, experiences, and joys into parenthood. And that's how we show up. And so really asking, you know, how were you disciplined? How um, did your parents show their love? When did you feel most loved? When did you feel like you had to perform? Um, and, and we talk about all of that stuff like very openly. And I think that that helps to kind of bridge like we don't want to do it this way like we were taught we want to go this direction um and so it is i think parenting adds this whole other layer and uh we were just talking about this with my mom because when we were little we asked my mom we said who do you love more dad or us kids and my mom confidently no bars ass said your dad and i loved that because you know, as a kid, you're kind of like, wait, what? That's not the right answer. But I loved that because it showed like they're the glue that holds us together. And when we're out of the house, when we're gone, like it's them and, and they're still together and, and really happy. And so um, remember that you're a team as parents and like you're, you're batting for the same team. Um, but I think too, that that dialogue can really kind of get to the core root of, of where you're disagreeing and where you can kind of decide to work together, uh, and move forward in either the same or a different direction. I love that. Has your two-year-old played mom and dad off against each other yet? Is that, oh, is she's that <laughs> super witty, but she, she acts very differently around both of us. And I think that's really interesting too, is if anyone in here has a stay at home parent versus a working parent, it's a very different dynamic with each parent. And it's super, I mean, it's, it's a juggle because she's with her dad all day. And then it's like so exciting to be with mom, but then it's like, I'm already kind of tired and I'm trying to be present. And it's, you know, it's this really interesting circus act that I feel like I'm constantly a part of, but, but I think I'm getting really good. <laughs> love that. Love that. <laughs> Hello. Um, oh my God. I'm, this is a bit embarrassing. Um, Why? There were, oh, there were so many things in today that really, what you said have really spoken to me, but the one that just made me go, oh no, was when, when you said um, about using tech to mute your inner voice. Yeah. And like, I'll have a really good day. I'll go off and do all the things I want to do. And then I sit down and it's, you know, it's, late afternoon early evening and it's like I've got all these things that I plan to do in the evening and I just can't do them and I just sit down and look at Instagram and and then half an hour later it's like oh no and then oh what am I going to do now oh the newspaper yeah Mm. yeah. and I hate it but do you have any tips for Absolutely, I do. (laughs) Because I've been there and I do that. Um, So something that's really interesting that actually very much inspired me is uh, about a month and a half ago, my husband said to me, he said, I deleted Instagram off my phone. And I said, what? And he goes, I'm really happy in my life. Why do I need to watch other people live theirs? And I said, whoa, like, yeah, it was like a mic drop moment of like, Wow. And, um, he, he sometimes will be like anything happening on Instagram. Did I miss anything? And I'm like, honestly, no. Um, but as someone who I, I think social media has this place, I remember there was this study done, um, with this generation that we find ourselves in that is always so connected and people would rather be shocked every five seconds than to live without their phone. And, hearing that realization and seeing the statistics that we pick up our phone like hundreds of times a day and and we use it kind of like a pacifier like I'm in toddler stage so you think of a pacifier you know the baby wants to cry you stick the pacifier in that's what our phones have become for us so one of the best things that we have done in our house is we have this really old chest and it it has a drawer in it and my husband wired it so that it has a charging cable it's like a docking station All of our devices have to live inside of that station. They don't live on the counter. They don't live on the table. They don't live in our pockets. They don't live on our hands. They stay in that docking station. And and the funny thing is, is that the drawer is really squeaky. So if somebody goes into it, you hear it and you're like, what are you doing? What do you need? Nothing's going on. Um, And so we started to create boundaries like that in in that sense, um, because we recognize that we all really struggle with it. I mean, 
let's be honest, like this generation, we can't even go to the bathroom without having our phones with us. Right. Like that's a problem. Um, and so what I think is so interesting is that when we think about using our devices and the media and TV and all these things almost as a way to numb, there's something deeper in there that we're avoiding, right? There's something that we're really trying to ignore and we're turning up the world's volume and like turning down our ability to even think. I've done it in absolute seasons of my life, um, seasons of grief, seasons of just like questioning. Um, but the clearer I get on my own life and think about what my husband said, like, if I'm so happy, why am I looking at everyone else? Um, it really helps to put things in perspective. So one, I would just say, start having like an out of sight, out of mind device idea. And, and if you live with anyone, help, have them help you be accountable to it. Like I'm putting my phone in the drawer or take my phone and hide it from me for a little while. Because what happens is, is it's kind of like running when you're like, okay, I'm going to run three miles. The first mile sucks. And you're like, there's no way I'm going to finish. And then something happens and you break through with devices. The first hour or two, you're like, I bet the city burned down and my, my mom probably called and, and somebody's having a heart attack and I don't know it because I don't have my phone. And like the more that you get accustomed to it, the more you realize I didn't miss a dang thing. You know, I, I, nothing happened while I was sleeping. Like how many of us look at our phones before we go to bed and then look at our phones when we wake up, what do we think was happening? Everyone was sleeping <laughs> or we should have been sleeping, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I would just say that the other thing that you can do, that's really helpful. There's an app and I'm not positive it even still exists, but I have it on my phone. It's called moment and it tracks your usage on your phone. And now with Apple devices, you can do it inside of your own phone. They've gotten so smart. They just make everything internal now. Um, but you can set limits. So you could say, I can only go on to Instagram for 20 minutes a day and a limit will pop up and you don't hit ignore. That's the part you got to say, okay, that's my limit. The time is up. Um, and so things like that, because it starts to just make you conscious. So actually my husband and I, every single week, we pull open each other's phones and we look at our daily usage and we see if it's trending up or down. And I think that opens up enough dialogue right there to say, is there anything going on or how are you feeling? Or are you stressed about something? Um, and so there are different ways to invite that accountability in. And I think accountability is the hugest piece when it comes to devices. Um, and so I get it though. It's, it's nothing to be apologetic for because I think we all do it, but I think even just starting with your observation of that and that level of consciousness is going to help you start to rewrite that story about how you're going to be spending your time as you start to move forward. So you're not okay. alone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenna. Hi Molly. Uh, long time listener of your podcast. Mm. Um, and I'm super excited. I signed up because I saw you were going to be one of the educators. So oh, my question you. is about comparison. Yes. Let's um, I know it's a thief of joy, yep. um, but what do you do? How do you deal with just seeing what someone else is doing and then losing confidence because you're like, A, they're doing it better than me. Yeah. Okay. They're already doing it. Yep. <laughs> why should, I mean, like, who's going to listen to me? I, it, sometimes it's just very crushing and yes. I don't know how to fix that for myself. Yeah. So I don't think there is a fix. Um, I think it is just a part of life, but there are tools around this topic. So, um, for me, like if, if you know me, I'm like this mix of like science, like science based. I love research, but I'm also a little woo woo. And it's like, where do these two things come together to like bring us hope and joy. Um, and so when it comes to comparison, I think that there's this beautiful way to flip the script on things. So for me now, as a businesswoman, if I see someone's doing something, I'm like, awesome proof of concept. They already do the hard work. I know that there's somehow a market out there. That's good news. Okay. Now, if they're doing it better than me, I think we should switch the word and say they're doing it differently than I would. Um, the thing that I, think about all the time because there are so many people who have podcasts. There are so many people doing what I do in a different capacity. They're doing it differently than me. And the cool thing that I've learned and something that I hope that each person in this, this session 
finds in their life is someone that's doing the same thing as them. And both of you are doing well. So for example, one of my best friends is Amy Porterfield. She's in business. We have courses on the same exact topics and we're both doing well. And neither of us feels like the other one's stealing anything from us. We have each other and we can, we can support one another. And so when we can look at it in a way of like, they're doing it differently than I would. There's already proof of concept out there. And if I don't use my unique gifts, I'm doing a disservice to the people that would benefit from them. I feel like that's a kick in the butt of like this person, like I, Jenna Kutcher cannot serve everyone. Brendan Burchard cannot serve everyone. We're not meant to, we're not meant to be for everyone. And I think that part of it comes from we're, jumping online and seeing people's chapter 10. Like I'm in, I just hit a decade as an entrepreneur. What you see today has been 10 years in the making. And with the way that the internet is, we're seeing people that have the pretty, you know, the pretty uh, presentation because they've already done the decade of the like dumpy work. And so I want for you to think about not how you present things, but how you show up because we're so focused on how do we present this in a way that will get people to buy in? How do we present this in a way where my sister won't roll her eyes that I'm trying something new? How do we present this in a way that looks like we know what we're doing, even when we feel like it's not. And it's not about how we're presenting it. It's about how we're doing it. Like there's a difference for anyone in here. That's an entrepreneur. There's a difference between looking like a business, meaning you have a logo and a website and being an actual business, meaning you're serving people and how, Helping people. And I think we're so focused on looking like something that we forget about the actual serving that makes us make an impact. So I think Molly, whenever you have those thoughts, they're going to enter. I'm not going to tell you they're ever going to go away. I have them all the time, but I try to flip the script and say, Oh, you know, she did this. That means it's possible for me too. Or, Oh my gosh, she's doing this. Like, I love that. I'm going to do it differently. But um, I just think there's so much opportunity and it's literally just word shifts and language shifts. Um, and then also just really being conscious of who you let into your world. Um, when I was researching confidence and learning that 60% of what our confidence level is, is based off of nurture. How are we nurturing ourselves? You being here today, that is nurturing you. You scrolling through and hate following people or following people that make you feel like crap, that is not nurturing you. And that is hindering your ability to believe in what's possible for you. So really it's okay to curate who you are consuming and who you're letting into your life. And I think that those things have made really big differences for me. Um, but again, it's just flipping the script. And I always think about what I would tell my daughter if my daughter said, mommy, that girl's prettier than me or mommy, she's doing something and I want to do it. I think, what would I tell Coco? I tell her it's possible. You can do it too. You know? And so it's like speak, mother yourself sometimes, you know, that's like what I need to do often in my life. So I hope that helps Molly. Good. It made me emotional, but good. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Well, I'm here and just some, I've been thinking about it a lot more, just entering another season of hopeful motherhood where I'm like, I'm in a season where I need to mother myself sometimes too. And what would I tell myself if Coco came to me with the same questions or concerns that I'm having? So I'm here for you. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Hi, Shaney. Hi. I first want to just say thank you. You're part of the re you are the reason I'm part of Growth Day, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just amazing how these uh, topics are just so relevant. Um, the topic of boundaries, especially in relation to phones, is something I've been working on very much in my life, and I'm doing really good with myself. <laughs> I don't have a problem putting the phone away but I'm also 48 years old. And for me, I kind of just miss those old days of no phones. My partner in life is 12 years, my junior, and he is um, very much not uh, creating any boundary with the phone. And it's, uh, I try to share and express how it's um, taking away from us, but 
not getting very far. And I feel like we're about well, we're almost 10 years in together and five years where it's gotten pretty bad, where I just don't feel like there's any separation between him and the phone. So my question is, how do you have any advice on how I can, because it seems to always create argument. How can I, without just continuing to be the, the uh, representation of what I want, yeah. how can I share with him how detrimental that is? I just thank you for your honesty and for sharing this, because I think it's something that so many of us like watching people's faces nod, struggle with either personally with your children, with relationships. There's nothing worse when you see people missing out on life because their eyes are down, right? It's like, look in front of you. Look at what's happening. Hello. Yes. You. Um, not to bring up Netflix again, I swear I don't watch a lot of Netflix, but the social dilemma. How many of you have watched the social dilemma? Um, yes, 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 yes. Yes. So, one, I feel like both when my husband and I watched it, we were like, okay, I know all of this. Like, I'm a digital marketer, I know all of this, but seeing how these devices are built to create addiction. Uh, is terrifying, right? Like it's, it's making us miss our lives. And so um, one, I would just say, if he's willing to watch it with you and have a conversation after it. Well, I'm actually a yoga therapist and it's a big part of my job. Right? <laughs> and yeah. I have watched that documentary with him. Yes. And this is like a big conversation on what it does to the brain. And yes. And when we're in conversation, he gets it. Yeah. But then when he feels like I'm taking away his ability to relax. So how can you introduce different ways to relax together? Uh, where like phones cannot be like kayaking. I'm thinking like, you're not going to bring <laughs> your phone on a kayak, right? Like <laughs> no one's going to risk losing that iPhone. Um, what are the point. ways going on walks together? Um, that was a huge thing for Drew and I, uh, just to getting that movement together and being outside together um, without requiring a phone because you don't need it. And so since you're a yoga therapist, I'd love to just challenge you doing puzzles together. Like things like that, which are so like, we love doing, it was so oddly satisfying and you could like sit down and have a little drink together or whatever. And we would make it a part of our night. We light a candle, put on literal like Zen music, like yoga music and do puzzles together. And we would find ourselves talking while we were in motion where it was like this slow reconnection without pressure. So if you needed to focus on the piece, you could, but you could also focus on each other. Um, and I think too is, is really when we look at boundaries, this level of communication has to be a piece of it. And I know that you said when you talk, he gets it, but it would be even interesting for you to document the ways that you're not being fulfilled. Um, okay. Even saying like, I was having this conversation with you and like you were on your phone or like if you find him missing things that you were talking about because he was distracted, like you're missing out on like what I'm telling you I need. Um, but I think well, we just had a major death in our family. Yeah. And this death was happening for the last two years. And I've over and over and over again said, she got to put the phone down. You were losing time. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. And it came. He took a week off. And I said, we need this. We need you to take a day off one day a week for us as a family. We need this. Like you missed out on a lot and she's gone now. And he said, no, no, I can't. So I think, I mean, I'm not an expert here, but when we look at addiction in general, this is just an example of addiction and so much addiction manifests in so many different ways. And how can we support? It sounds like he's in the denial phase. Um, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I, one, you are doing an amazing job setting an example, but sometimes that isn't enough. Uh, and I think two, you are doing, I just want to just commend you. I think all I want to do is wrap you in a hug and say, you're doing an amazing job and I care about you. That's all I want to do. Sometimes there is an advice when we don't, we can't be together and can't work it through it together, but 
the fact that you're hurting and feeling alone and isolated and missing out, that's like what I care about the most. That's exactly right. And I'm so grateful for growth day because I feel like it's the main way I'm connecting right now. Yeah. Well, stay, stay connected here and um, stay in touch with us and how we can support you. I'm sure there's an expert in here. Look at the comment section right now. You are strong and loved. We give you a big hug, sending you a hug. I'm praying for you. We see you. We hear you. We love you. You are doing great. I want for you to like absorb all of that in today um, and just know that you have a family right here um, and that we so much do this. Doesn't it just remind you how much we need people? We need each other. Like, man, I will never take for granted uh, the way that the internet connects us, right? Because the internet can be a really crappy, addicting thing, but it can also be the most beautiful gift that we are so blessed to have each other in. And just you being a part of this community is, is incredible. Hi, Jenna. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Loving, loving all your energy and your great ideas. I just love them. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like Audrey in that I've got too many uh, balls in the air. I'm not sure if they're glass or plastic, but um, so I do have that, uh, that issue to uh, and want, would like you to, to expand a little bit more on how to, um, uh, you know, if you've got you boil it down, you still have three things. I'm an actor, so I still have that to do. I've started a publishing business, so I have that to do. And I, and I want to create a movie uh, for which, which, which uh, is a series. So um, about my family in the Maritimes uh, from the 1800s. Um, anyway, uh, it's hard for me to sort of get focused on you know, and I think it's chunking it down. So I do one one day, one the next, yes. one the next or something. And the other question I had was about I loved I loved all the information about women's cycles and stuff. And when you're more powerful, I wondered if you had any any ideas for us guys. <laughs> <laughs> Love your women well. Love the women in your yeah, life well. <laughs> I love women well, I take care of them. I, I don't do Valentine's Day because I do it every week. You know, so that's. that's what's going on. I love that. So one of the things that came to mind, because I love all three of your ideas, and I think something that we often forget is that we are all multi-passionate people, right? Yeah. And I think the world and society wants to put us into boxes and give us these specific titles that make us feel like we can only do one thing. And I know as a creative person, that has never been okay with me. And that's never something I want. I never want to live under one title. I want to be evolving because evolution means we're growing and learning, right? And so one of the things that I think about, since all three of yours are somewhat related, is to really look at how are you going to make the most progress first? So what is the lowest hanging fruit? So let me explain this. A lot of times when we get overwhelmed, it's because our ideas are so big and so grandioso. It's like the God dreams on our heart that like feel like our legacy, right? And, and we're so fired up about them, but we're also so overwhelmed at the idea that our life is going to pass us by and we're not going to do this thing and we're not going to accomplish this, this thing. And so we lose sleep over it. But one of the things that I have learned that is so true for any stage of the game is momentum is powerful. And when we start getting results in any area of our life, it starts to fuel us to get results in the others. And so when we look at what is the lowest hanging fruit for you, Drummond, where is something that you can take action and start proving to yourself that you're worthy of getting that results? Where can you start building that momentum? It starts to shift things. And a lot of times with my students, they have these really incredible ideas ideas, but there's so many hoops to jump through and so many barriers for them to actually make progress that they fall flat. They feel the shame cycle. They start to question their worth and their identity. And then we start all over again. And so one of the things that I think is just powerful is saying, where can I actually make the most action? It might not be on your motion picture film about your family. That might be something that's like your life's calling that legacy piece. But if you start getting momentum in the other areas of your life, it might open doors for you to start getting that creative vision or to find the right partners for that bigger project. And so where is a place in 
in your life that you can confidently and successfully start taking action and getting yourselves results. That's where I'd start. And then it'll open up more doors. And again, if you look at things like batch working, it doesn't necessarily have to be a day set aside per task. It could be say for the next month, I'm going to focus on this one thing just one thing. I'm going to focus on taking action and moving forward on this one thing. And then after this month, we'll take an assessment. We'll see where we got. We'll see what we do. Maybe we move on to something else, but maybe we've learned valuable tools that we can take into that next project. So batch working doesn't just have to show up in our day-to-day life. It can show up in the way that we're focusing our careers, our projects, our lives, our family time, like however you look at it. Does that give you any inspiration, Drummond? Yeah, it does. It does resonate with me for sure, Jenna. It's uh, I'm, I'm very much like you when you were saying that I was nodding, you know, uh, about the fact that that there is no uh, I can't boil it down to one thing. There's just yeah. I just have too many interests and how boiling. How boring would that be, right? What's that? Yeah, how boring? <laughs> so how would that boring? Be? Exactly. <laughs> I have too many things to accomplish, and so uh, I, I I boil it down to three, which is great. Um, but it's the question is, like you say, the, 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 the series, the film series is a, is a massive, um, which, you know, massive task, which yeah. continually, you know, is I, I've been on it for like a year, but I keep falling off and going, Oh my God, that, that's, it's just so massive. I can't do anything. So I forget it for a month. So yes. chunking it down sounds like, uh, like one good strategy. Uh, do you have three things? It sounds like you've got three things going at once. You've got podcasts over here. You've got a, you know, a social media over there. I suppose they're all linked in some way. But- I have an amazing team. So I am not a one woman show by any means. I am supported by amazing people. And I think too, that getting support in your life, whether that looks like your family or having the right people to speak into your life or the right friend group. So I am able to focus on multiple things because I have many brains behind me that power me when my brain feels like mush, which is often. (laughs) This can be your day for personal growth. This can be that day you committed to and you remember and you go, that was the day I got myself a community. I got better coaches. I committed to making my life the absolute best that I could. This is that day. Make today your growth day. Click the button on this page and sign up right now.